Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm glad to be in Paris with all of you and to um, give my presentation on Nishida's theory of embodiment. There was a subtitle um, uh, about self-cultivation and other, other stuff. And uh, when I read my abstract again, uh, I got a bit scared because I thought that uh, from my abstract I should have written a whole book or something. So I can't do everything that I promised in my abstract, I'm sorry. I'll just try to, um, to do um, the things that uh, for my presentation right now seem to me to be the most suiting, so yeah. Okay, um, before I start my presentation, I want to um, uh, mention two publications. First by uh, Matteo Sestadi, The Knowing Body, Nishida's Philosophy of Active Intuition. Uh, which um, was published in the Eastern Buddhist in 1998. And another pu publication by uh, John Muraldo, who's here also, um, uh, titled uh, Nishida's Koi Teki Chokkan and the Notion of an Action in Cognitive Science, which uh, was published in 2015. So I drew um, on, I, I um, my, um, I did a project yeah. on Nishida's uh, theory of the body, but um, I also drew on these two um, papers for my presentation, so I'll um, refer to them later again. Um, first of all, to get a, a little introduction into uh, Nishida's thinking, um, there are different um, ways of um, giving different periods of Nishida's uh, philosophy. Um, one of them is this uh, three-part um, system. Uh, which says that from 1911 to 1923, uh, Nishida mainly did a, a psychologistic, voluntaristic uh, philosophy, um, which is connected to his um, notions of pure experience and self-awareness, uh, Junsui Keiken and Jikaku. In this time, he's mainly influenced by William James, Henry Bergson and uh, Fichte, and of course other thinkers from the um, for example, Neo-Kantianism and uh, many others, but uh, this is just um, uh, some of them. So um, after this period, there, um, one can say there was a logical, idealistic period connected to his uh, logic of place, which lasted from about 1924 to 1930. And then the last period, which is most important um, for our topic today, is um, from 1930 to 1945, which is uh, the historical practical period where um, the self-formation of the historical world becomes a central topic in Nishida's thinking. And also um, his term acting intuition, um, Koi Teki Chokkan, um, becomes a very uh, central notion uh, in his thinking here. Yeah. So um, I want to give one quote by Matteo Sestadi on this, um, this last period or um, in, in relation to the, the former period. So I quote, uh, in the logistic period, Nishida maintains a certain di dichotomy between interiority and exteriority, emphasizing interiority. The human being is fundamentally a homo interior. Accordingly, the historical world is based upon self-awareness, jikaku. Turning to historicism, Nishida eliminates this difference and the external world becomes as ontologically important as the mind. So from this quote, we can also already see that um, there is a major shift, shift in his thinking from the second to the third period, uh, which means mainly that um, the idealistic perspective, um, which started with pure experience, is um, there, there is a, this counterpart of the historical world, which uh, includes material, social, um, and other practices co um, connected to the to the kind of external world, which is not external in the sense that the mind is so deeply connected to this world that it can only uh, express itself in the world and can only become uh, a reality in the world. So there is no mind um, opposed to the world, but mind and world are kind of one system. And this is one thing that uh, deeply connects to certain strains of um, contemporary uh, discourses about embodiment. Maybe I can uh, come to this later again. Um, we see this, this shift in uh, Nishida's thinking also in the way how he talks about uh, the place or basho, 
um, or the field in which reality um, comes to be. So in the, in the second period, he mainly talks about the place mirroring itself in itself. So he speaks a lot about mirroring. And in the, in the last period of his thinking, he also uses this mirroring um, met metaphor, but more often than that, he speaks about that the world uh, forms itself in itself. So his idealistic uh, philosophy of the place, which mirrors itself in itself, becomes a more poetic um, ontology of, of the poiesis of the world creating itself in itself. It's still a mirroring in that the world, uh, in its creation of itself, um, forms, uh, forms certain entities and processes, and these processes are themselves uh, self-formational processes. So the world is kind of a self-formation of self-formations. Um, some of the, um, I, I just listed some of the works um, which are um, central to this um, last period of Nishida's thinking and also to his theory of the body. Um, for example, logic and life, acting intuition, human existence, the world of physics, or one of his last essays, life. And um, from this notion, life, for example, we can already see that um, he was deeply interested in biology, but also in physics and other natural sciences. And uh, his theory of the body came about um, when, he, when he was um, trying to um, use his theory of the basho, of the, of the place, and connect it to different sciences and to, to um, other spheres of human uh, experience. From the middle to the last period, there are um, major famous philosophers who influenced him, like Hegel, Leibniz, Bergson, Marx, Aristoteles. But there were also um, writers from other um, sciences who influenced him, and I just gave some of them. So, for example, John Scott Haldane, um, his work, The Philosophical Basis of Biology, uh, is often quoted by Nishida. Uh, and um, also Ernst Kapp, um, Fundamentals of the Philosophy of Technology, is a, a German philosopher, philosopher of technology, so he's kind of one of the pioneers of the philosophy of technology or uh, Ludwig Noiré, Das Werkzeug, The Tool. Um, here we can already see that um, the tool making and the usage of tools becomes a very central topic in Nishida's um, late period. But also um, the creation of artworks and the uh, artistic practice uh, becomes very central, which we can see also because he, he refers to uh, authors like Konrad Fiedler, um, The Origin of Artistic Activity, and um, as we saw before, also physics, um, he, he refers to James C. Maxwell, matter and motion. So he, he tries to, to look at these different sciences and um, try to cope with them with his logic of place. But um, while he does this, his logic of place gets transformed by this, um, by this, by this writing about, about the sciences, about art, about different activities. Um, one thing that's maybe uh, um, may, maybe of use to uh, kind of get a grip on his um, on this philosophy of the body um, is that there is there are two perspectives in uh, in his writings. One is the third person perspective, which is the self formation of the historical world. So it's kind of the ob objective side um, of, um, of of what Nishida tries to describe. And then there's also the first person perspective. From the from the acting self, looking at the world or acting in the world, which is his, uh, which he tries to cope with with his uh, notion of active intuition. So that's kind of the way humans exist for Nishida in in this historical world. Uh, I'll come to these notions um, later on again. First, I want to um, try to um, find the place of the body in Nishida's late philosophy, and I'll um, give some quotes. The first quote. What we think of as our life is nothing else than a self-formational process in which the world forms the world itself. What is formed in this way is our body. So there's kind of this historical world, and one part of this is the process of life, the biological process of life. And human beings are integrated in this process, and their body um, is kind of a product 
of the self formational process of life. Um, but from this quote, it seems that the, the body is just a product. Um, but Nishida always speaks of um, um, a motion from the created to the creating, and the body is also included in this motion from the created to the creating. The body is created in the natural world, but it goes on to use tools to, to um, change its environment, and thereby, thereby it becomes something creating, something um, transformative, transforming its environment. So, <clears throat> Because it's not just one body that lives in the world, and not just uh, one form of life, um, the historical world builds different um, self-formational processes which um, determine themselves, but also mutually determine each other. And we can um, discern different levels uh, in Nishida's thought there, which is like, there's the most universal thing, uh, which is, in this last per period, the historical world. This is like the place of all places. Maybe one can all also think that behind this place, there's still Munobashu, the, the place of nothingness. But more importantly, uh, um, the world features in his last philosophy. So, in this world, um, there's, through the self-creation of the world, um, different environments or an environment is formed. Different species of life, different societies of human beings. And in these species, um, the body and the individual, the, the embodied self, um, comes into being. The thing gets more um, difficult, though, because um, uh, there's the problem of multiplicity, which um, I try to kind of capture with the following quote from Nishida. The spatial is at the same time temporal, and the temporal is at the same time spatial. And this fact constitutes an active form. The self-determination of the temporal socu-spatial, spatial socu-temporal eternal now is morphogenetic. Through this form, countless self-determining species emerge. Countless self-determinations, quad-determinations without determinant have to emerge. Life has to be something like this. As you can see, um, Nishida's late philosophy is closely connected to his um, dialectical or even paradoxical logic, and there are a lot of special um, notions which come into, be, uh, come, come into play here. For example, his, um, the expression of Soku, which uh, is kind of an encapsulation of his paradox logic into a, a, a single term. It, uh, it means something like that two terms are absolutely opposed to each other, but at the same time form a unity. So it's something um, paradox. Two things which are absolutely opposed, which cannot be connected, are connected. And this is like, uh, for Nishida, um, almost uh, like all uh, levels of reality have this structure. So because there are countless selves and countless spe species uh, in this historical world, there's the problem of multiplicity of embodied subjects, groups, societies, <laughs> maybe sometimes even worlds. It's um, uh, subjects or groups or societies um, sometimes feature in the plural form in Nishida, and sometimes even the world itself uh, is described as a plural plurality of worlds. So there's the problem of complexity or hypercomplexity in the background of his thinking. I try to give some uh, graphics on this, so uh, just to, to give an image of this. So um, I try to give this uh, kind of circular things to, to show that it's, self, it's a kind of self-formation, uh, self-relational. Um, it's, it's not that there are um, substance, substances or um, diff definite um, entities, but these entities change themselves all the time, so they are already themselves um, self-contradictory. They change through time. They are never the same uh, in the next moment. Even in the same instant, they are already changing. And uh, then again, um, there are the embodied selves, but also things and tools. And the things are also formational processes. The things are not just um, passive uh, things taken by human beings, but they, they call for human beings to be used in a certain way. And the, the environment calls for the human being to do something with it, to creatively transform it. So the things and the tools are also part of this 
process of life and of society. And then there's another um, <coughs> complexity in this, because every individual is part of the historical world, but at the same time transcends this world, in the same way that's, that the world transcends the self. Because each individual may fall under the notion, for example, of human being or of life form. But every single one of these individuals is so individual, so singular, that if you look at it in all its concreteness, it can't be um, subsumed under, under a notion or under a place. So it is imminent in the world. The subject is, as an embodied subject, is it, it, it is imminent. But at the same time, it transcends um, all its um, determinations. Nishida also speaks of a discontinuous continuity, which means that there is a continuity between us. We are living in the same space. But at the same time, we, we, um, we are something different from each other. We are something, um, uh, I don't get the English expression now, but we are, we are, um, we, we don't know each other fully. We are kind of a provocation for each other. We are, we are kind of opposed to each other. We're living in the same space, but at the same time, we are kind of colliding. So now I want to get a bit more closely to the body. Initiative's philosophy. It could be close to the body. Um, the first quote. Our body is something created as well as something that creates. It is something seen as well as something that sees. So here you see that already in the body itself, there is this, this mutual interaction and contradic contradiction between, between first person perspective and third person perspective. We ourselves see, each, see ourselves in a third person perspective as, as, as this body. But at the same time, we are the one, the body itself is the one who sees this. So the body itself is all, already a self contradictory entity. It, it kind of sees itself from both sides which seem to be opposed, and which are opposed, but at the same time connected. And then the second quote, human beings are bodily entities, and at the same time have their body as a tool. And this um, double aspect of the body, this ambivalence of the body, that it is, we, we are our body, but at the same time we have our body as a tool, as a thing. This closely connects to um, a difference made, often made in phenomenology. Um, for example, in, in German ph phenomenology, we have the, the word Leib, which is um, the lived body, and a Körper, which is kind of the objective body. And for example, the anthropologist and philosopher Helmut Plessner, he has this difference of being one's lived body, but having one's objective body. So this difference between being and having, both incorporated into the body. And we see this also in Nishida, this, this, um, this complexity of the body, this ambivalence. But because of this ambivalence, the body can function as a, uh, as a central site of mediation between different uh, aspects of reality. So because the body is objective and at the same subjective, it, it can mediate between these two spheres. Um, there are also other things, like in, in this quote, Ordinarily, we think that the senses and reason are opposed to each other. Needless to say, they are mutually opposed. But from the standpoint of historical reality, we have to think the body in between them. We ought to regard them as two ends of one and the same. So again, reason and the senses, or reason and uh, feeling, are mutually opposed, but at the same time, they are mediated through the body. And this topic of mediation, and also of species as a mediation between the individual and the universal, um, comes from uh, an influence of Tanabe Hajime on uh, Nishida's thought. So he, he, he criticized Nishida's um, philosophy uh, in different texts, and Nishida took up this uh, criticism and tried to um, develop his philosophy, and he integrated this important aspect of mediation. Yeah, so different aspects of reality can be thought of as being mediated by the body. 
then it's interesting to see which expressions uh, Nishida uses in his works. So um, there's, for example, the historical body, which, which means that the, the body is a um, biological entity, but it's also shaped by human history. It's a kind of, it's an entity in society. It's formed by cultural habits. So it's natural and cultural at the same time. The practical body, which shows that uh, the body is always integrated into practices. And there, then there are also expressions like um, the linguistic body, for example, which, um, which shows that the, the body, um, language is not disconnected from the body for, for Nishida. Language is spoken by the body. Texts are written with the body. So the body itself is, in some sense, itself linguist, a linguistic entity, or the logos body. So the body itself is something logical. Logic is not disconnected from the body, but it's kind of a um, it's kind of a mirroring or forming of the the body in which the body shows its own existence. And these bodies um, form historical somatic societies. So this connection to society is also very um, important in Nishida's um, thinking. Okay. So uh, I kind of covered this. I have to look a bit uh, at the time. So this is um, Nishida would have the opportunity in the Japanese language to, to make these differences um, in <coughs> analogy to the, the, to the phenomenology like körper, leib, and leib körper, objective body, subjective body, subjective, objective body, which would have um, Equivalence in Japanese in Karada, objective body, me, subjective body, and Shintai, subjective, objective body. Nishida only uses Shintai. Uh, it's not, uh, I'm not sure if it's um, on purpose, but uh, maybe Nishida would be even opposed to make this dif uh, difference be between Kerpa and life, subjective and objective body, because for him, both sides are always connected. You can't really um, disconnect them. So Shintai is kind of a combination of the two. OK, so um, we already had the self-formation of the historical world. The other side, um, the personal uh, side from the human being, first person perspective, is Koiteki Chokkan. Uh, about this notion, Nishida says, to grasp things active intuitively is to see them by creating them, to know them through poiesis. So, to really know things, we have to interact with things. We, we, we are not just observers, but we interact with things. We, we take them up, we, we read them when it, if it's a book, or we create new books, or we change the environment. And we only know the environment by changing the environment. And we also know ourselves by changing ourselves and the environment. Um, I'll skip this quote. <coughs> Um, because I want to give another um, aspect of, of Nishida's um, philosophy which closely connects to current debates, which is um, the body as a natural technology. So first I quote, Without a body, we would not be able to see anything by means of movement. We can think of the body as the embodied subject of movement. And conversely, it is through movement that one sees other bodies. We make tools with our hands and make things with tools. A tool is something separate from our body. It is a thing. However, it is through the rec recognition of tools that one comes to know one's body. The soulless machine is what enables us to know the soulful machine, that is, the organic body. Jean-Paul states that what is mechanical is more immediate to us than anything internal to us. Having said this, Naturally, this does not mean that the interior can be known only from the exterior. Leibniz states that at a certain limit, the machine ceases to be machine. That is, it becomes mere matter, while, while an organic body is a machine even to its most minuscule parts. We know of causal re relationships from the outside, but the organism must be autonomous from its very root. So what Nishida is saying here is kind of that the body is more mechanical than a machine, because the body is so finely structured that even its most minuscule parts, like the cells and the parts of the cells, are self-formational processes. 
in the machine we'll get to um, maybe to a material basis which is kind of only matter. It's, it's not a safe formational process, but a cell is kind of a living entity in itself. So even to the cells, the body is structured. And Nishida um, connects this to different organs, mainly to, the, mainly to the organs of perception and the organs of manipulation. <coughs> he says that uh, the body is kind of uh, a connection between this perceptional process and the manipulational process. So we, we see things while manipulating them. And we, uh, we, we act in the world while seeing what we are acting. Okay, I, I think I don't have time, but um, now I want to <laughs> I wanted to kind of uh, open up this uh, initial <coughs> theory to uh, to contemporary debates, and um, especially to um, a form of um, embodiment theory which is called an activism. Um, there was uh, a new edition of an, an older book uh, called The Embodied Mind by uh, Francisco Varela, uh, Ethan Thompson, and Eleonor Roche. Uh, it was kind of a pioneer work in uh, in this section. Uh, and one thing um, I wanted to show is how Nishida's uh, theory of the body kind of connects to these um, current debates. And also um, in Morales' article, he, he tries to show this and show, show differences and uh, similarities. So I'll, I'll just skip this and come to Morales' um, uh, criticism of Nishida from the perspective of um, current embodiment theories. So he says basically that um, Nishida's uh, notion of koiteki chokan, of active intuition, um, it, uh, sometimes Nishida, is, Nishida describes it as immersion, like uh, that we become absorbed in things, that we become one with things. And at other times he says that uh, we interact with things, which means that we are not becoming one with the things, but we are uh, interacting, just interacting with them. And uh, Morales says that um, the interaction model uh, fits much better to Nishida's later period, and he uh, should just stick to, the, to this. Um, first, I thought that yes, this is um, very correct, but then I thought, um, do these two um, models have to be um, opposed to each other's to each other in Nishida's philosophy. And then I thought maybe it's, it's both. It's two different aspects of what um, Nishida describes as, as practice or as uh, poiesis. So we interact with things and we are, because of this discontinuous continuity between us and the things, we are opposed to them. And in this mode, we interact with them because we are not immersing in them. But at, at, the, other, at the other hand, we experience ourselves at, um, in, in a continuity between ourselves and the objects. And in this sense, if this aspect is stressed, then the immersion model gets stronger. So I think we should uh, all, um, leave open both uh, options to interpret Nishida's philosophy. Um, then another um, quote from Moraldo, um, uh, in which he says that uh, the an action theory of embodiment um, tries to show that the body is included in a, in a whole variety of forms of knowledge, not just intuitive knowledge, but also um, more conceptual kinds of knowledge through metaphors and stuff like that. Uh, the body even plays uh, into our concepts. And that Nishida's koiteki chokkan, active intuition, is, uh, seems to be more restricted to immediate knowledge, to being uh, immediately present with the things. I think that um, Nishida's notion is, uh, it's, it's true that his notion is closer to this immediate ex experience, but um, since it's just the other side of the historical reality forming itself, uh, one could say that uh, for Nishida, um, conceptual knowledge is also based on bodily uh, experience. So, um, for example, uh, Nishida talks about thinking, and he says, thinking is not something detached from our body. Thinking means to probe into the depth of the body. Shintai ni tessuru koto. I, I didn't really know how to translate shintai ni tessuru, but I translated it here as probing into the depth of the body. So for, for Nishida, thinking and conceptual knowledge is also dependent on this bodily knowledge. 
Okay, so um, John Morales also gives different um, possibilities to translate the term active uh, koi teki chokkan. Um, they are the traditional ones: action intuition, active intuition, acting intuition, and Morado, um gives additionally action-oriented intuition, performative intuition, and inactive intuition. Inactive intuition uh, relating to the current debates in inactivism. But since um, this theory, Nishida theory is mainly based on poiesis, on the transforming of the environment, I would say one could give an even more radical translation and say that it's poietic intuition, transformative intuition, or even intuiting production, to stress the productive side of this notion. Okay, I think I'll just quit here. Uh, there's another notion, which is the notion of autopoiesis in, uh, in activism, which could be closely connected to um, Nishida's self-formation of the world, but uh, I think I'll just quit here and maybe we can talk about it after the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. I think we all wish we had more time. I would like to open to one very quick question. Or <coughs> comment for something. Okay. So I have a presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I wanted to know, um, do you think that how we conceptualize tools <coughs> can be uh, seen and considered in the same way as technologies that you embody literally, that you put inside your body. I'm thinking about uh, neural implants, prosthetic mm -hmm. limbs, all those kind of technologies that actually go inside your body. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you realize they mediate your experience, sometimes you don't, as something implanted in your brain. So do you think that changes the, how we would talk, how we discourse of life <coughs> organization with technology? Or do you think that the, some parallels will form? Um, I think that the knowledge that these technologies are now available would change Nishida's way of thinking, but I also think that uh, his theory is kind of compatible with these post-humanist um, kind of trends. So um, he already speaks of the tool becoming part of the body and the body being uh, building one system with the environment, which kind of connects also to the extended mind theories. And these theories, I think, are very compatible with uh, this post-humanist um, uh, trends, yeah. I, I'm not sure what Nishida would say about this, so there's, there's always an ambivalence in this, like kind of uh, extending the, the possibilities of the body but losing some kind of freedom uh, or giving away some kind of self-responsibility and I know, don't know how Nishida would think about this, but yeah. Also the, the new emerging AI um, systems like uh, neural networks and stuff like that um, it would be really interesting to connect this to, to all these new uh, technologies, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think we can discuss more.